Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another exciting episode of Catholic Chat. Joining me today is Katie Hugo from the Franciscan University of Steubenville. It's great to have you, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, as you can probably already tell, today is going to be a bit of an unusual episode of Catholic Chat. Uh, I'm not here in terms of uh, visual. Those of you listening, I guess, can't tell the difference. But uh, those of you on YouTube will definitely notice that We've been de- battling some technical difficulties, but today is also going to function a little differently. Usually we'd have a student discussion, but Katie here is our expert on Father Emil Capon. So Katie, could you, uh, well, first of all, start off by telling us a little bit about who Father Emil Capon is. Okay, so in short, Father Emil Capon was a chaplain in the U.S. Army during um, both World War II and Korea. Um, he was captured during the first three months of the Korean War, and he died in 1951 in, as in the, a prisoner of war camp. Um, he received a Medal of Honor almost, over 60 years after his death in um, 2013. He's one of the most highly decorated military chaplains in United States history, um, and he's actually up for canonization as well. His title right now is a servant of God. Um, there was supposed to be a meeting of um, the people of the cardinals that decide who gets um, to be up to the next stage of whether he was supposed to be venerable or not. That was supposed to happen mid-March, but I couldn't find if it happened or if it didn't happen because of the pandemic. So um, that's where his canonization is right now. Wow. And, you know, for those of the viewers who are a little bit unfamiliar with the canonization process, uh, I hope this isn't too on the spot, but um, what are the steps that someone like Father Capon would need to take to be uh, canonized? Um, so the first step would be servant of God. The, um, the di- home, his home diocese or his or her home diocese would do like look into his life, make sure that, you know, he's like, or he or she is a like legit and like good person and everything. And then they'd send it over um, to the Vatican and that would make him a servant of God. Um, and then the next step would be like for the Vatican to um, like say, okay, we're gonna investigate him further. That would, it's my understanding, I'm not a theology major. So um, it's my understanding that that step would make him a venerable. Um, and then you need one miracle to be beatified and then a second miracle to be canonized. Well, I appreciate that overview for sure. But getting back on the uh, specific topic of a uh, father, why Father Emil Capon? Uh, what exactly drove your interest? And by the way, we'll have the link to your article in the description. It's a fantastic piece. All right, thank you so much. Um, what drove my fascination with him is that um, in spring, uh, 2018, so two years ago, I took a class at my school um, called uh, the Korean and Vietnam Wars. Um, it was a history class, and I was a history major um, when I was at school, and I was like, okay, this class sounds interesting, not a topic I know much about, plus it was taught uh, by one of my favorite professors. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll go take it, and then during this class, he had us write um, a paper on a topic of our choice relating to either the Korean or Vietnam Wars. Um, and he had half mentioned Father Emil Capon in class. And I was like, huh, I don't know who that is. Let me do some research about him. And then that spiraled into a paper. And then that spiraled into my two year long fascination with him. So yeah. Well, that's great. Now, did you mention did he die in the war or did he live after that? Um, so he died on May 23rd, 1951, um, in a prisoner of war camp. Um, so that was towards the beginning of the war. Oh, wow. Do you have any fascinating facts about his life while he was a prisoner of war? Uh, of course, there's famous saints like Maximilian Kolbe, whose ministry was very much amplified and so many great deeds were accomplished within the confines of a prison camp. Are there any such stories involving Father Capone? Yeah, so during his time in the prisoner of war camp, um, he ministered and served to the other men in the camp, including like making socks for them, taking care of those who were um, ill and dying. Um, And he would also steal food for people in the camp. And I just, when I read that, I was like, wait, what? A Catholic priest stealing something? 
but then like the um sources that i had went on to explain he was doing it so that or so that they um other prisoners didn't die so he was doing it for a good cause i guess um and then an another one of the s interesting stories that i found there was that um many of the fellow prisoners uh, attributed his, their survival directly to him. And one of um, these prisoners um, who are carpet uh, crucifix for him in, uh, in his honor. And what's interesting is that this guy that um, carpet crucifix for him was actually Jewish. So like, doesn't have any religious significance for him personally, but he ra uh, rather he realized that this had significant um, meaning for Father Capon's memory. Now, that's just incredible. I think it's really beautiful to see faiths come together like that, especially over something as bloody and awful as war. And yeah, I, I like how you mentioned him snatching some extra food for those who were starving or dying. Um, in our Western context, uh, in our Western liberal context, we like to think of property rights as, you know, it's mine. I, I, I own things, but the traditional Catholic view of ownership and property is actually a bit more complex. It actually goes as far to say that if you are starving and uh, you are owed justly, justly owed food and uh, you take said food from someone who isn't giving it to you but should be giving it to you, that, that's not stealing because all property is ultimately owed, owned by God and is owed to those who need it the most. So I like how you brought that up. It does sound a little bit funny though. Uh, a stealing priest like that yeah yeah especially since like one of the ten commandments is you shall not steal um is there any particular part of his life obviously you've touched on a couple things already that really inspired you personally as far as your own prayer life or your own work or anything of the sort um so I mean, I, like I said, when I, I just graduated, but when I was in school as a history major, so just learning anything and everything about history, like, has always fascinated me. So I just really, like, appreciated being able to, like, dive into his life, see what he did. But as for the more, like, theological side, um, I guess I just really appreciated, like, seeing that, like, Catholic pre like Catholics being, like, out there, like, in the like, world and trying to help people and make, uh, make other people's lives better. So that's what really, like, stuck out to me on the Catholic side. Oh, fantastic. Now, you mentioned how he administered to a lot of people in the prison camps themselves. Were there any interesting stories of how he would interact with uh, the enemy? Um... I couldn't find any particular stories about him interacting with the, um, the guards while in the prison camp, but right before, like, when he originally got captured but was not yet in the prison camp, um, there was a story that I found of him, um, like, pushing back against one of the, uh, North, or the North Korean captors. He saw a, um, wounded American, um, soldier like laying down in a ditch with um like the opposing or, or a member of the opposing military like o over this guy in the ditch about to um shoot and kill him um and father capon walked up um pushed the um enemy combatant aside and like picked up his um fellow countrymen and just like carried him on his back um so i thought that was interesting because i'm like not many people would like try to like push around somebody from the other side when they've just been captured yeah that's uh remarkable that takes a lot of bravery for sure but working backwards uh you know from that and his time in service were you able to find any reasons why he even decided to embark on such a perilous journey and a uh, mission so what i was able to find is that his um he grew up in a like a farming community in Kansas um and he always wanted to be a priest um he really wanted to like be like his local parish priest um and so like that's why he decided to like become a priest in the first place um as for joining um the chaplain corps I wasn't able to find a reason um for that I just assumed I always kind of assumed it was uh, like uh, World War II, like, patriotism, because he originally, um, enlisted in, uh, 
1944 to go um, fight or to go be a chaplain in World War II. And then when he came home um, in 1946, he stayed home for a few years, but then re-enlisted um, in 1948. Um, so I wasn't able to find a specific reason for it, but I, I just assumed it was uh, patriotism. I'm sure that a lot of people over in Kansas are quite proud to say that, you know, we, we've got someone like him, you know, coming from that part of the country. And in your research and, you know, after you shared your article with people, did you discover any other people who have been passionate about his work in particular? Um, like I mentioned that uh, my professor had offhandedly mentioned him in class and when I turned my paper and my professor was like, oh my goodness, this guy is so cool. I'm really glad you did your paper on him. But otherwise than that, most of the reactions have been, oh, this guy is like really interesting. I've never heard of him. I've heard of Father Vincent Capadano from Vietnam War, um, but I've never heard of this guy from the Korean War. So as far as sources go for listeners who might be looking for more information about him, are there any in particular that really were useful to you or quite informative? Um, so when I Googled, um, when I was originally doing my research, there's a lot of um, articles from the various Kansas newspapers that I found very interesting. You'll be able to find them um, just if you Google. And then there's uh, actually an official um, it's called the official site of the cause of canon of, uh, of the cause for canonization of Father Emil Capon. It's run by the Diocese of Wichita, um, which I found interesting. Um, and then there's also um, a book called William or by William Maher called A Shepherd in Combat Boots, uh, Chaplain Emil Capon of the First Calvary Division, which was published in 1997 um, by the Bur uh, Bird Street Press. Great. Well, we'll include those links in the description for sure, like I said, as well as your article. But, you know, before we close off this uh, brief but informative session, are there any other things that you really learned that you'd love to share with, uh, you know, everyone else about, you know, just discovering this man's incredible journey? Um, so, yeah, there's a couple things that I would like to share. Um, so, he was born on April 20th, 1916, which that year was Holy Thursday. Um, and as I'm sure many of the viewers knew, Holy Thursday oh, wow. was the day that Jesus instituted the priesthood. So, it's just kind of interesting to see that, um, like, that date be reflected in his life. Um, and then another thing that I found interesting is that when he was captured in, uh, November 1950, um, he was, or during the battle, um, during the battle, he, uh, was able to convince some of the Chinese officers to order their men to stop shooting so that surrender negotiations could, um, be worked out with, like, with as many, um, people surviving as possible. So it really shows that he did, um, care about his men. Um, like not just his men, but like the uh, people on the other side as well. He wanted to say, hey, I don't want to see anybody killed. So he actually won the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor um, in 2013. This is the nation's highest military honor. Um, it was given to him for selfless service during like when he was captured and um, like during the prisoner of war camp. And he's actually only one of five chaplains to ever receive this honor. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, and his um, nephew, so his brother's son, um, was able to receive the award on behalf of his uncle um, since um, both his, uh, the brother and the parents had passed away by that point. Um, and he's the most highly decorated military chaplain in U.S. history. And there's also been a, like a couple wow. of miracles that have been attributed to him as well. Um, one was from a girl that had a really rare autoimmune disease. And she was able to like uh, miraculously recover. And the doctors who were Protestant were like, yeah, we have no explanation as to why this happened. Um, and then another one was from um, a guy who was running a 5K a few years ago. Um, and he had like went into lethal cardiac arrest and his cousin who was there started praying to for, uh, for Father Capone's intercession. And he survived. The doctors were like, I don't know why you survived. This was supposed to kill you. Um, and all he needed was pacemaker, so. 
So yeah. No. Oh, wow. Hopefully those will uh, end up contributing to uh, you know his uh, eventual canonization, God willing, of course. Thank you so much, Katie, for joining us today. This has been a fascinating subject, and we'll link your article in the description. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Mm-hmm.